bit of background, I'm going to be talking about a wooden chip model that is all of about this big. Um, and a bit, a bit of a background to that. Um, one day in 1998, I was flipping through various books in our small uh, nautical archaeology program library, and I came across an MA thesis by uh, Dr. Chris, Mon now he's Dr. Chris Monroe, entitled The Boat Building Industry of New Kingdom Egypt. As I turned the pages, I came across one illustration that quite literally shot me out of my seat. Uh, this is the image that I saw. This gave me what I like to call a flat forehead moment. Flat forehead is when you go, how could I have missed this one? Uh, the reason for this is that my latest book at that time, Seagoing Ships and Seamanship in the Bronze Age Levant, had just come out. In it, I had covered what I thought was all the data related to the topic of the title. And this painted wooden model, of which I had been unaware, was one of the most important, um, if not the most important, known representation for our understanding of a, the Aegean galley class used both by the Mycenaeans and later by the Sea Peoples. In other words, this model was, for me, the one that got away. Uh, and I was really embarrassed. I contacted Chris and asked him if he had any intentions of publishing the model. He did not and kindly suggested that I go at it. This, however, wasn't as easy as I had expected. I made contact with the Petrie Museum in London, uh, which is where this, this model is, uh, is located. And it turned out that the, mu the model had just been sent for conservation and that uh, it was not going to be available for study for a while. And I contacted the museum several times, and only in 2005, this is after 1998 was when I first became aware of it, in 2005 I, uh, it came back to the museum, and Dr. Stephen Quirk, who was the curator of the museum, uh, invited me to come study it. And so in 2005 I uh, spent a week in London just recording this model. Now the bottle is made of wood and it's only 38.5 centimeters long. And yet for the, the study of ancient seafaring in the 13th and 12th centuries BC, it's one of the most valuable documents that, that have come down to us and also apparently one of the most ignored till now. Um, I should point out that we do not have a single fragment of uh, one of these actual ships. Nobody's ever found a Helladic galley or a uh, Sea People ship, and trust me, I was one. Of, I'm been one of those looking for them. In 1920, uh, Flinders Petrie reinitiated an excavation at Guru. The site is located at the southeastern end of the Fayum district in Egypt, just south of uh, the uh, Delta, and is generally equated with the Ramesside. Harim town identified in text as Me Where. The main goal of the expedition was to examine the site's tombs. In tomb 611, <clears throat> the excavators discovered a wooden ship model broken in half. No photos existed of the model in situ. This is the original registration card. It records, apparently in Petrie's own handwriting, frags of painted wooden boat on wheels. The model was the only artifact found in the tomb. In the 1927 report on the excavations, the boat model received a short description and this reconstructed drawing of it by Petrie. In 1933, uh, in an article entitled Egyptian Shipping, Petrie produced this drawing of the model, which showed a few changes in his reconstruction. Now notice that the bottom one has been flipped here. Uh, first, the stem post had been reversed so that the vertical element faced the stern instead of facing forward as it had in the earlier reconstruction. Like so. Oops. Here. Uh, and we'll address the identity of this decoration shortly. And secondly, uh, Petrie moved the quarter rudder to the model's port quarter. Finally, in her monograph on Guru, published in 1981, Thomas included a, a museum photo of the model on its port side view. In the photo, you can see the quarter rudder has been placed rather incongruously at the bow. Uh, this is what the model looks like now. Uh, it's very fragmentary. You just touch it and, and little pieces fall off it. It's really uh, very delicate. 
As noted by Petrie, the model had been broken in half prior to its internment. We're missing almost the entire carriage and parts of the model itself. This suggests that it was broken elsewhere and that only some of the parts were collected and then deposited in the tomb. So why is this unassuming model worthy of attention? Uh, we'll get to that, but before, we, before I get there, I just want to um, show a, a slide which you might not expect to see it in a lecture on ancient ships, but which is very relevant and somehow uh, connected with Belgium also. In a series of paintings, the famous uh, Belgian surrealist artist Magritte, René Magritte, uh, placed the statement, ceci n'est pas un pipe beneath a smoker's pipe. Magritte was right, it's not a pipe, it's a painting of a pipe, it's a representation of a pipe. And when studying ship iconography, we must, we must keep this point in view. An, icon, an iconographic dis, depiction is not the object itself. Thus, in ship iconography, we do not see ships, but rather representations of ships refracted through the eyes, minds, and hands of their creators, as well as through their culture, schooling, mental attitudes, and skill sets. The results at times depart considerably from the prototype. There are a variety of reasons for this, which include, but are not limited to, the artist's or artisan's capabilities, familiarity with the prototype, sources of information, difficulties in translating the shape and details of the prototype into the chosen medium, art canons, and others, just to name a few. So, what indicates that this model represents a Helladic-style uh, galley? The most telling element, the one that popped me out of my chair when I first saw it, is the bird head uh, ornament atop the stem post. Now, your first reaction is probably, well, that doesn't look like the head of any bird I've ever seen, right? You're, you're probably going like this, well, that's not a bird. Uh, well, let me give you a little background to why that is a bird. Um, let's take a look at the evidence. Um, there are only two other known appearances of Helladic style galleys in Pharaonic Egypt. The first, and undoubtedly the best known, are the multiple representations of a single sea people ship in Ramses III's naval battle against them, which is depicted on his mortuary temple at Medinat Habu. This is the earliest representation of a naval battle uh, and one of the most unique scenes in all of Egyptian art. Note that it is not a sea battle in the sense of being fought in open water. Apparently, Ramses III caught the invading fleet unaware when it entered the Nile Delta area, probably via the Pelusiac uh, branch of the Nile. And incidentally, for anyone interested, those ships probably survived somewhere on land uh, along the route of the, Pel the Pelusiac uh, branch of the Nile, which has dried up. The five northern ships of the Sea Peoples all appear with bird head stem and stern ornaments facing outward. In this case, the bird's beaks are definitely horizontal and look quite natural, right? Now, there's another site, and uh, the second example of a Haladid galley is from a remarkably unlikely place, and that's Dukla Oasis, located here far west of Luxor, out in the desert. This graffito was discovered and photographed by Winkler in the late 1930s near Taneda in Dukla Oasis. It represents a Helladic style ship with a pointed bow facing right. Now Winkler never published the photo, however, fortunately for us, Lucy and Bash, who's here with us today, discovered the image in the archives of the Egypt Exploration Society and published it in the 1990s. Uh, unfortunately, and noting that this was a Helladic ship. Uh, unfortunately, the top of the graffito has been broken off, so we don't know how the stem post ends here in this case. But to our aid comes the fact that four of the figures standing in the vessel are holding models of ships. And interestingly, the models held by the figures have bird head terminations facing forward atop the stem and stern posts but these also have horizontal beaks. But vessels of the same type depicted on late Helladic 3C, that is around 12th century BC pottery, <clears throat> more commonly show the bird's beak as curving upward in what seems to be a remarkably unnaturalistic representation, as in, but exactly as in the case of the Gurov model stern uh, uh, stem ornament. 
and here you can see those in an enlarged view, that vertical beak. And that does not, those vertical beaks incidentally do not appear on Mycenaean pottery showing birds or on uh, Philistine pottery. As we have seen, Petrie himself reconstructed the stem post once with the bird head facing the bow and then with it facing the stern. The model stem post still facing the stern is now glued solidly into the bow structure and is unlike unlikely to be moved anytime soon. At some point, the beak broke off and is now one of the unattached fragments associated with the model. Another element that identifies this model as replicating a, an Helladic galley is the pointed, almost ram-like cutwater bow. During the late Helladic 3B and 3C, Helladic galleys in the iconographic record appear in two distinct, shall we say, flavors. Some of them are blunt bowed, as for example, these representations from Asini, Medina Tabu, and Skiros. In other cases, the bows end in a distinctly pointed shape, and the Gurub uh, model fits comfort comfortably into this group. I should point out that there, these are not rams in the classical sense. They weren't used for ramming, uh, but maybe the beginning of the development of a structural element that eventually, probably in the classical period, evolved into a waterline ram, the classical uh, weapon. Many of the representations of galleys from the late Helladic 3 BC have an element that, for want of a better name, I termed a horizontal ladder decoration. Understanding what this is basically will allow us to understand what these, how, these, what, what, how the galleys look. In some cases, this element is so predominant on representations of Helladic galleys that the entire ship becomes a horizontal ladder, as in this case. This is a graffito of a ship which is painted upside down uh, in a late Minoan Larnax. Below, the same image is seen as seen right side up. And I think what happened here was the artist was painting it while he was standing up, so he drew it like this. That's why it's upside down. Um, in 1981, which is a while ago, in an article dealing with the ships of the Sea Peoples depicted at Medinat Habu, I proposed that these vertical lines represented a row of stanchions, that is, vertical upright timbers that support the ship's superstructure. Like the later galleys of the geometric, archaic, and classical periods, these stanchions would have crossed a rower's gallery, which would have been open. In other words, you would have been able to see the rowers through the, uh, this gallery, you would see at least parts of their bodies and you'd see these vertical stanchions supporting it. So this would be the area through which you would see uh, the bodies. And here, notice the entire hull is just a line. They've, they've, and it, this comes back to Magritte's pipe. They've reconstructed the, the hull here, the ship. And this is exactly what we see now in this galley, a galley, again, as an oared ship, appearing on fragments of a late Helladic 3C crater from, and I hope I don't destroy the name, Badimagedji Tepe in western Turkey. Here you can see a line of rowers with their oars in the space below the deck on which the warriors are standing. Between each two rowers is a vertical line. The vertical lines are stanchions which support the structure above them. Similarly, we have a situation on two late Helladic 3C ships from Pyrgos Lovinaton, um, identified as Homerikinos. Here we see the torsos of the oarsmen, each attached to his oar in the open rowers gallery, while their heads are hidden by the screen above them, like so. I like to call this the case of the headless oarsman. A series of sherds dating to about the end of the 8th century BC depict two banked galleys, or dieres, class, uh, clarifies this phenomenon. Notice how these rowers portrayed on a later archaic period sherd from the Acropolis are situated in relation to the screen uh, above them. Now, in this sherd, also from the Acropolis, the heads of the rowers in the lower row disappear behind the screen above them. And this one's my favorite. Uh, on this proto-attic shirt from Falaron, the heads of the lower row of uh, oarsmen disappear entirely behind the screen. That's exactly what we're seeing on the Pyrgos Lovinoton shirts. The best example of this, though, is still the, the one I worked with first in 1981. And uh, we see this open rowers gallery very clearly <coughs> on the Sea People ship at Medinat Habu. Now, remember, there are five representations, but they're all basically copies of one original. 
you're not seeing five different ships, you're seeing five representations of the, a single ship with more or less detail. Um, the most detailed representation is a ship that has been capsized by the Egyptians and is portrayed upside down. The ship consists of three horizontal zones, which are, and all, um, you have the hull itself, which again, because it's capsized, is at the top. Over here you have the screen, and here you have the open rowers gallery, which if this thesis is correct, you should be able to see the rowers through it. Now we have three independent clues proving that this is indeed the case. Notice these three bodies and how they are intertwined in the various elements of the ship's hull. So number one, here is a warrior built, uh, sitting atop the capsized hull. His right leg is stretched out along the length of the hull, while his left leg disappears behind the hull and then reappears in the open rowers gallery. The second warrior sits astride the screen with his right leg outside the hull. His left leg disappears behind the screen, but then reappears behind the bottom of the screen in the central area. Finally, uh, warrior number three is looped around the screen with his body disappearing behind it, but then reappearing in the area of the open rowers gallery. Like so. Thus, if we turn the ship around right side up, we have three different clues all pointing in the same direction that this was an open rowers gallery. So that a reconstruction of such a ship would look something like this. And this is almost identical with some changes as to how Lionel Casson had pointed out that a similar situation exists on representations of later geometric ships. Here we see the legs of warriors standing on the rowers' benches, and these are actually descendants of this type of ship. And this is a reconstruction of a, uh, a ge uh, generic geometric galley that Professor Casson had done. Now, why was I so excited about the um, uh, the Gura model. Coming back to the model for the first time we have in three dimensions, we have the stanchions. We have the stanchion holes for the stanchions, and we have the stan some of the stanchions themselves. The model was found with eight of these. Five of them have survived. One is glued permanently into one of the stanchion holes. Uh, originally, the model had nine stanchions on each side. I believe that the number of stanchions is based on what looked pleasing and proportionally correct to the model maker. Better indication for the number of actual rowers in the prototype ship is a line of black dots that appears just below the shear strike at the top of the hull, which presumably represent oar ports. These are best preserved on the starboard section of the bow seen in this slide. The number of visible suggests that the actual prototype ship may have been a pentaconter or 50 oared ship, in other words, 25 oars to a side. We're missing any of the superstructure into which the tops of the stanchions would have been slotted. Presumably, these were attached to whales, that is, heavy longitudinal timbers, that's whales, W-A-L-E-S, not W-H-L-E-S. Um, so they would have been attached to whales, uh, as seems to be the case in some other representations of helatic galleys, as seen here at Hama and Tragana. So in reconstructing a, reconstructing a virtual model of what the model would have looked like originally, uh, this seems the most conservative manner to terminate the stanchions. I should mention that I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Donald Sanders, president of the Institute for the Visualization of History. The book has now come out, and it has, as part of the book, has a free open access website. I'll be happy to give anybody who's interested the web address uh, where you can play around with three-dimensional images of the model as it appears today and as reconstructed, like this, this image here. And you can literally turn it around on your computer, plus any part of the boat that you're interested in, there are uh, high-quality uh, photographs that you can download to look at this because in the book itself we could not pub publish color photographs. It was just too expensive. Um, and by clicking on any part of the hull, you can then get uh, the, the image that goes with it. The model came with one quarter rudder. The rudder has a single hole to attach it to the model by means of a pin. 
a corresponding hole on the stern uh, port quarter, that is the left side, indicates that it would have been attached to the model there, while the angle at which it was attached is indicated by the cut at the bottom of the quarter rudder. So we can do something like this. And this is how we reconstructed on the virtual model. One of the fragments found with the model appears to be the blade of an oar. From that, we reconstructed a set of oars for the model. Now, for early Aegean ships used by the Minoan and Cycladic cultures of the Bronze Age, we are truly blessed. We have the exquisite polychromatic miniature frieze from the West House at Akrotiri on Thera. Unfortunately, it's, that's not the case with the Helladic type of, of ships. They're almost always represented in silhouette form, and we have very, there is a little bit of evidence, but not very much evidence regarding color. The painted details of the Google model are therefore particularly fascinating. For example, Homer speaks of his black hulled ships. The Google model shows exactly what Homer was talking about. The ships were covered with the pitch below the waterline as a protectant. The stem post, now here, uh, the stem post serves to lock in a painted uh, forecastle deck. Incidentally, I should point out on an actual ship, the stem post would have continued the line of the stem, like so. Uh, the placement of the stem on the Gora model is undoubtedly an aspect of modeling the vessel and not of the prototype of the vessel. And that's something we have to keep, in, and again, I get back to Magritte here. We have to remember that there are uh, changes. Now, this is a view, a top view of the forecastle deck. That blurry item at its center is, of course, the stem post. Forecastle now lacks a screen, but clearly this was not always the case. A stain shows that the screen would have been where the, where the screen would have been situated. Notice also traces of red paint here. Now note the blue cover, uh, color covering the deck. And see the blue paint on the gesso rising along the line of the missing screen. This strongly suggests that the screen itself was painted blue. So that's how we reconstructed it. Um, and this is a tentative reconstruction of the forecastle area. The stern apparently also had some uh, kind of uh, stern castle, but nothing of it, uh, of it has survived. We only have negative evidence from that. First, a patch of the stern where the gesso is missing, and second, missing gesso along the edges of the model which suggests that we probably have a screen there also, but we have no evidence for color here, so we left it translucent, like so. There was a, the stern ended in a notch, and this perhaps is related somehow to the stern platform. Now I come to one of the most interesting pieces that were fi was found with the boat, and that is a rectangular plaque uh, decorated with red and blue stripes that was found with the model. Petrie placed it, and correctly so, amidship beneath the hull in his 1927 uh, reconstruction. Petrie was right in doing so. The model has a hole at its bottom amidships to receive a peg. The peg deposited some blue pigment inside the hole. This pigment likely came from the blue stripe at the forward edge of the hole in the center of the plaque. So it is possible to confirm Petrie's reconstructed uh, location for the plaque, but what does the plaque represent in relation to the prototype hull? And here I have to say, when I began my work on this model, I assumed that because it had wheels, it was a child's toy. Well, there was a rude awakening here. The Egyptians depended on the Nile as a principal transportation superhighway for watercraft. It is hardly surprising then that the watercraft played a significant role in Egyptian religious life, stemming from from this was the perceived need at times to transport vessels overland. There were three primary reasons for this. Funer funerary boats, movement of gods, as in the Opet festival, or for divination. There were several manners of transporting these vessels. The, nor the normative way to transport a cult ship in Egypt overland was for priests to carry them by means of long poles. Well, grain, in a fascinating article published in 1917, this is what really shifted my focus, demonstrated that these poles for porters were attached to a structure which he termed a pavois in French uh, that I understand can be translated as a shield or a buckler. And this is on what, on 
what the cult ship actually sank and uh, uh, sat. And I believe that this is the identity of the rectangle. This, for example, is the sacred bark of Amun in a scene from the time of Pinujem II, a high priest of Amun. And there is significant detail here to see the pavois. This might also explain the purpose of the long pegs found with the model. Six were recovered. There are now nine. It's a case of spontaneous generation. Uh, Petrie incorrectly reconstructed these as overextended stanchions, five of which are now permanently glued into the model stanchion holes. But I believe they may have served as the support bars attached to the pavois. There are a number of unidentified fragments that were found with the boat, one of which has a flat white surface, while on its decorated side it has a fragment of a round peg glued to it. Second fragment may have belonged to the same piece. Perhaps the model was built with the intention of being able to display it both on a wagon with wheels as well as a pavois with carrying poles. The idea of a ship being transported in more than one manner is not as strange as it sounds. This is a scene from the tomb of Nachtamun at Kurna, tomb 335 at Dir el Medina. It dates to Ramses II and the beginning of Merneptah. We see here multiple manners of transporting a ship-shaped cattle folk overland. Here we see porters carrying the ship on poles. But for, just for a good measure, on the right side of the same scene, the ship is also towed by groups of men and by oxen. So here we have three different ways of moving a ship at the same time. And incidentally, this guy also has a pavois. Thus, this modest small rectangle of wood tells us two really important things. Uh, first of all, that this model was a, a cult boat. It was not a child's toy. And it also demonstrates a fascinating example of syncretism, which amalgamated local Egyptian customs with a ship and therefore customs that were entirely foreign to the country. So just to wrap it up, to whom did the model belong? The Wilbur Papyrus dates to the uh, reign of Ramses V. Uh, it is the longest and most important text from Pharaonic Egypt dealing with land owning and taxation. Unbelievably fortunately for us, it deals with the region around me where, around Gurob, the ancient, and is probably roughly contemporaneous with the Gurob model. It lists numerous, and I mean numerous, in over a hundred, Sheridan, which are a type, one of the groups of sea peoples living in this specific area. Additionally, a stella found by Petri at nearby Heracleopolis also mentions a fortress of the Sheridan. All in all, and again, this is, I can't prove this 100%, but beyond reasonable doubt, the most, the most likely uh, possibility is that this school ship actually belonged to a Sheridan or a descendant of the Sheridan. Finally, you may have noticed that I've not discussed the wheels found with the model or the missing cart. It's very important to emphasize that now, once we understand what the, that little slip of wood is, this is not a model of a ship. It's a model of a model of a ship, okay? It's a model of a ship cart that was used in cult. A study of the, and that took me an extra year. I wrote another chapter in the book called Wheels, Wagons, and the Transport of Ships Overland. And it is, uh, brought me into some of the most bizarre research and most fun research I've ever had. Um, so we can talk about what happens, where, what does it mean cult-wise, but that is really a topic for another lecture. So thank you very much. <laughs>